we're not going to bring what you need, so take it out. Alright, and then um, we are doing a Christmas launching on December the 12th, and so you'll be hearing more about that. There will be sign-ups um, within our small groups to sign up for specific things to bring for that. There's also, a, in your bulletin, there's a lot of new Christmas offerings, so check that out. Um, is there anything else I'm missing, Greg? Okay, we're good. Okay, we're good. All right, Mr. Bob, you want to open us in prayer? And if Campbell's, you can make your way on up. Let us pray. And Father, we thank you once again for the ability to come to worship you in this house this morning. Thank you, God, and direct us, Lord. Help us to praise you, Lord, in all that we say, all that we do. Please help this time to, or please help us to be energized in this time so that we can go into the world and be the disciples you would have us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. We let them have your family some meetings to listen to the Yara Park for doing our hope, growing our love, rejoicing in Christ, and finding peace, rest in peace. <laughs> <laughs> Isaiah 7, 13 to 14. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel. In ancient times, God gave his people Israel hope by speaking to them through the prophets. He revealed what was to come and told of the great blessings they would receive when Jesus, the Messiah, would dwell among them. The people look forward to the coming of the Messiah with hope. We find the same hope when we read the words of the prophets, a hope that is eternal. Isaiah 40, 31. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, help us remember this season what a special gift Christ is. His birth, teachings, words, death, and resurrection. Father, as we celebrate this Christmas, may we also do so filled with hope. Hope of eternal life. Hope of eternal life. May we remember that Christmas colors remind us of that hope. The evergreen for everlasting life. Through the precious, perfect blood of Christ. Again, Father, thank you for your gift. And Jesus' gift of eternal life. Now and always. Amen. Amen. So stand with us this morning as we sing, um, Holy Spirit, you're welcome to me. You know, the Holy Spirit is always with us. But sometimes, you know, if you think about it, somebody shows up to your house uninvited or you don't know who they are. They can be there and you can have a cordial conversation or you can invite them in. You can have a relationship with them. You can find out more about them and share together. They're there no matter what, but it's our hearts that make a difference. As we start worship today, we want to welcome the Holy Spirit who's already here with us. We just need to acknowledge His presence. So join us this morning as we sing.
Advent is all about waiting and anticipation. You know, sometimes we are filled with that excitement of waiting, like children waiting for Christmas, like being out in the woods waiting for that ten pointer to walk by, <laughs> or teens getting their driver's license, or adults waiting for the joy of a wedding or a birth. There's so many things we can get excited for while we're waiting. But there's also times of difficulty as we wait. Parents anxiously waiting for those drivers to get home at night. Somebody who's lost a job anxiously waiting to find a new job. A spouse who is ill. As we wait for God to provide our needs. Isaiah 40 begins with the words of comfort and ends with words of hope. Those who wait upon on the Lord and their hope in Him will be renewed. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. God is always with us. No matter what we're anticipating, no matter the joys, no matter the sorrows, no matter the anxiousness, the stress, He is always with us. We're going to be singing the Revelation song. And it reminds me when the word said, Holy, holy, holy Lord, the Lord God Almighty, who was, he was with us, who is, who is with us right now, and who is to come. He's going to be with us in the future. He is always there. We just need to acknowledge that and embrace his love for us. Let's sing Revelation song. Mm-hmm.
changed? Did you change your plans? Or did you allow God to change your plans? I did a little research on our next song, Indescribable. And Laura Stories was the, the writer of the song. And um, so I'm going to share a little bit about her story. You know, she was an aspiring symphony conductor. That's what she wanted to do. She played the bass string there. You know, she never sang until she was in her 20s. She was standing in line in college, doing her registration thing, doing her proper thing. And she was a young life leader, and so she was, had her young life shirt on. And she saw this other guy who had a young life shirt, shirt on, and so they started talking. He's like, come join my band. She'd never been in a band before. She said, all right, I can do that. I'll, I'll come join the band. I can play my string bass, and I can do that. Okay. Then... The vocalist left. Guess what? She was asked to be the lead vocalist. And she's like, I don't sing! <laughs> kind of what I used to say up here. I don't sing! <laughs> but, but she followed God. And she became a singer. And then she started writing songs. Then she joined another band. And life was good. Then her manager came and said, Hey, Laura! Why don't you do an independent single? Let me read you her words. That would mean I have to sing on it. And why would I do that? <laughs> why would I do that? But she was obedient. She was obedient in her writing song. She was obedient in that. And she wrote that song and she, she had an album. But as it wasn't until Chris Tomlin came along. And one other one young life leader said, hey, why don't you let Chris Tomlin have this? This song. And her words was, that song will never work. That won't work for corporate worship. There is no way congregations are going to sing that. Plans change. Her plans change throughout her life. Her plans are probably still changing. Our plans change. The difference is, are we allowing God to change our plans? Or are we changing our plans? We need to allow God to move in our lives. Let me show you a couple other plans change. Prophets were called to give God's message. That wasn't their plan, but they were obedient. The sh Mary was supposed to marry, marry Joseph, and they have a family. God says, wait. You're going to be the mother Plans changed. The shepherds were hanging out in the fields. They were watching their flocks. They were doing their job. God had a different plan. Plans changed. The wise men, they followed the stars. They were doing their thing. God put a star up there and said, No, plans change. I want you to know my son. I want you to share my son with others. His ways are so indescribable. We don't know His ways unless we seek His ways. And He may give us just a little step at a time. Because if we saw the big pictures, we might go running. So our call is one day, one step at a time to follow His lead. Are you willing to follow it? Are you willing to go where He's calling you? Are you allowing Him to change your plan? Am I willing to allow him to change my plans to follow? Let's see in this round.
Heavenly Father, we pause once again to praise your name. We thank you for all the doubts and gifts you can store upon us. We now bring back a portion of what you so freely give. Use it to further your kingdom, and we will give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. that it's a scripture we often hear so much 
a Christmas time because it's not one that's so much a feel-good scripture. But as we listen to this, I challenge you to listen to it in kind of two perspectives at the same time. Consider whether or not this might be scripture shared and spoken for today. But then at the same time realize that this was scripture given by Isaiah to the people of the time of the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 64 verses 1 through 9. Oh that you would rend the heavens and come down. That the mountains would tremble before you. As when fire set twigs ablaze and caused water to boil. Come down to make your name known to your enemies. And cause the nations to quake before you. For when you did awesome things that we did not expect. You came down and the mountain trembled before you. Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for Him. You come to the help of those who gladly do right, who remember your ways. But when we continue to sin against them, you are angry. How then can we be saved? All of us have become like one who is unclean. And all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf and like the wind our sins sweep us away. No one calls on your name or strives to lay hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and have given us over to our sins. Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay and you are the potter. We are all the work of your hands. Do not be angry beyond measure, Lord. Do not remember our sins forever. Oh, look on us, we pray, for we are all your people. These are words of a prophet. Spoken hundreds, thousands of years before Christ. But I want to point out just a few of those things in, in chapter 64. First, oh that you would rend the heavens and come down. The inviting, the asking, the yearning. You did awesome things we did not expect. The mountains trembled before you, recognizing the power. No, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for Him. Isaiah here is talking about waiting and the benefits of doing that. Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay and you are the potter. We are all the work of your hands. The waiting is still happening, but as that waiting happens, there's change to taking place. And that change can be us allowing God to shape us as a potter with clay in his hands. And then the scripture ends, look on us, we pray, for we are all your people. Acknowledging that we are God's. We're going to come back and touch on several of those throughout our conversation this morning. Someone asked me this week, why do we focus on waiting for the Christ child? When the Christ child has already been born. You ever thought about that? Why do we spend four weeks... Waiting on the Christ child. When the Christ child has already been born. Does it make any sense? I thought it was a pretty good question. Let me ask you some others. What's something you're currently waiting for? Think about that. 
What emotions surround the time of waiting that you have? Do you find it challenging to find hope while you're waiting? Let me give you a little bit of a true, real-life illustration of something that's going to happen in the future. Not that I'm planning to be a prophet. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure this is going to happen. You see, there is this <coughs> fourth grade young lady that's going to get a huge surprise this Christmas. And she doesn't know it yet. Unless she happens to be watching this on Facebook. But there's some friends of hers, some teenagers who she just connected with pretty well. And they wanted to do something special. So there are going to be a few families getting together and, and they know that this fourth grader is excited about Christmas and just anticipating things. So you know what they're going to do? They're going to wrap a present for her. A real, legitimate, awesome gift. It's going to be almost four feet tall in a box. And her name is going to be written as big letters as possible across the front. And when they go and they get together, this is going to be brought in the house. It's going to be put beside the tree because it won't fit under the tree. <laughs> and it's going to sit there. And when they get to the point that they're opening presents, this fourth grader is going to have to sit with the teenagers. And they're not going to let her move. They're not going to let her get up. And she's going to have to go last. Because she's going to look at that present for a very long time until everything else has been open. And I ask you those questions again. What do you think the emotions are going to be for this year? What do you think she's going to do? What do you think is going to be happening? This is something of what waiting can be like. And no, I'm not going to tell you what's in the box. Not until after Christmas. If you care, come back and ask me after she's opened it, because I ain't giving away that. But, let's get real. I talk about that. There are a lot of times we can stand up here and we can say a bunch of stuff that sounds good. We can say religious words. We can, we can say things that, that come from some theological teaching and it can all come together and it can make sense, but we wonder if it's really real in our lives. So now we're going to get real. Yes, we wait for the Christ child. Yes, we talk about that. Yes, that was true in history. Yes, that's important. It was a physical Messiah that was being anticipated. And what happened in those older times do affect and influence us now. But there's also something else. In the midst of the Messiah, you know why the Messiah was so important? Because along with the Messiah, there were also promises that were made in regard to the Messiah. And what the Messiah was going to do. So you see, with the hope for the Messiah was a hope of so much that was wrapped up in who the people were who had been promised the Messiah. So I want to think about four aspects of the prophet's proclamation of hope. First, there was hope in the midst of waiting. And I, I want to suggest that, that one way there could be waiting, even in those times, was for healing. For healing. Sickness. Healing emotionally. We were told that things were going to change. It was prophesied Jesus would have a miraculous ministry. In Isaiah 35, 5 through 6, this is what it said. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped, then the lame leap. The lame will leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness, the streams in the desert. These are the promises that were heard 
as the Messiah was prophesied, so they weren't just being prophesied that there was a Messiah, this cute little baby that was going to come and it was going to be nice and they were going to be a king. They were saying that the Messiah was going to change their life. That's why they were excited about the Messiah. That's why there was anticipation. That's why there was fourth grade on the edge of the couch anticipation and not being able to wait for what's about to come. But you know what? With that prophecy, we already have fulfillment. And I don't mean just the birth. Listen to Matthew chapter 11, verses 2 through 6. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples and asked them, Are you the one who is to come, and should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind have received sight, the lame have walked, and those who have leprosy are clean. The deaf and dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. The prophecy is fulfilled. And it continues to be fulfilled today. So if we're in need of healing, there's a Messiah who brings that promise that we can and we will be healed. Second, there is anticipation filled with hope. And I want to couch this in the idea of hoping for the impossible. Even when what you're hoping for seems impossible, no matter how long it may be, God will not let you down. And you will experience reminders of reinforcement of that promise along the way. If you will but allow it. God does not send you on a journey alone. An example of this was God's covenant with Isaac's ancestors. The prophecy said, Then God said, Yes, but your wife Sarah will bear a son, and you will call him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him, an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. This was a prophecy. It was a far-fetched prophecy. He wasn't even sure he could believe it. And Sarah, the one who was to have the baby, who heard over her being said when she was going to have it, laughed as though it were a joke because she thought it was that impossible. Yet it was fulfilled. Nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be back. God does the impossible. And we have hope. We have anticipation. We have the proclamation that comes with the Christ child. Thirdly, uncertainty gives way so, have you ever just been uncertain about your future, uncertain about what was going to happen? There are so many people that their uncertainty comes in the sense of hoping for acceptance, hoping for affirmation, hoping for worthiness, because they're struggling to feel that. And you know, People are just not even sure that this Jesus person can be for them. Now we may wonder how can that be the case. We, most of us here, most of us that are here in this evening would say, well, we know we're accepted. We know God loves us. We know we're worthy. And I think we believe that. There are times we may struggle with it, but we know it. I see a lot of shaking hands. But you know, some of the problem is sometimes because of the way we live that. We can, hopefully unintentionally, we don't mean to do it, but we're part sometimes of the problem in people thinking that God can't accept them. 
Because sometimes we think who God is is the God that accepts and loves and cares for people like us. Because when people aren't like us, we sometimes wonder where God is there. And so we project in a way that people wonder if, are these people saying that in order to have Jesus, I have to be like them? Because that's what it sounds like. That's what it looks like. I had a conversation, I, I can't verify it, but I know it's true from the perspective of the person who shared. That there was a church. Not a church that existed off in some other state. But a church in Virginia. Who they went to. And there was a person that came in and the person was just not not really nice and neat and he actually smelled. And he walked in and literally even people who weren't close to him could smell him. He, he kind of got over in the corner in the front and he was kind of by himself. And um, I think it made a few people uncomfortable. And um, eventually sometime during the service some men got together and he was escorted out. I don't know. I, maybe there was good reason for that. Maybe it wasn't safe for him to be there. But the problem was that as far as this person ever knew, that person was up, never seen again or connected with that church. Now again, I don't know the whole story, but I can see that there can be times that we can just be made to feel so uncomfortable that we can't worship in our pretty place and sing our pretty songs and feel our pretty feelings when we have somebody beside of us that doesn't look good. So, I want to share this with you. It's another prophecy from Isaiah. Isaiah 11, chapter 10. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the people. The nations will rally to him, and his resting place will be glorious. The roots of Jesse will go out. The fulfillment of this comes, and you'll understand it more fully. It says, many people, because they heard that he had performed the sign, went to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world is going after him. Now, there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with the request, Sir, they said, we have come because we would like to see Jesus. The Gentiles. Were. The Gentiles have been prophesied that, that the Messiah would also be for them and now it's fulfilled. The Christ child is for everyone. Not just the church people. Not just the people that have made good decisions. Not just the people that have read the Bible through. Not just the people that can afford to have a nice dinner. Not just, there's not a not just anybody. Christ's child is for everyone. And we know that. But do we share that? Do we live that? Do we proclaim that? Do we help people to feel that? Or do we ever allow ourselves to be pulled in the direction that what we say or what we're over here heard saying or what we put on Facebook makes even one person feel like that person who proclaims Christ can't possibly want to share the hope that they have with me. And then fourthly, hope overcomes darkness. And this one, I want to talk about that. Has anybody here struggled with death? Ever had a struggle with death? Maybe struggling with death now. As a believer, though, I can tell you this. 
There's, there's no believer, if we really think about it, if we really embrace who Jesus Christ is, what He did for us, not a single one of us wants to live on this life, on this world forever. We just don't. We struggle sometimes with death, but I can tell you, we do not want to be here forever. And this is why. The prophecy was that the Messiah would conquer death. On this mountain, he will destroy, this comes to Isaiah chapter 25, verses 7 and 8. On this mountain, he will destroy the shrouds and inf that enfolds all people. The sheep that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. I see some of you right and looking at Isaiah chapter 25. Verses 7 and 8 is where that prophecy was given. And then listen to the fulfillment found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 54. When the perishable had been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true, death has been swallowed up in victory. We don't have to fear death. The best explanation I have of this comes from a book that our men's group is going through now. And um, I'm just going to kind of summarize a, a illustration that came out of that. There was this the teacher and a student together and they heard a noise. And um, the student said, what's that? And the teacher said, I don't know what it is. What do you think it is? I don't know. Well, what's the worst case scenario? What's the worst thing it could be? He said, a lion. <laughs> well, okay, why would that be so bad? Because if it's a lion, it might attack me. And what happens if it attacks me? I don't know, what happens? I could die. Yeah, that's probably the worst case scenario. Well, we'll talk a little bit more. Said, um, well, what happens if, if you get sick? What do you mean what happens if I get sick? What's the worst case scenario if you get sick? I get so sick I die. Yeah, that's worst case scenario. Well, um, let's take another one. Suppose, suppose you, you have just things are going really bad and you lose your job. What is the worst case scenario with losing your job? Well, I lose my job and then I don't have any money. What's that worst case scenario? Well, I don't have any money so I can't get any food. So, that's the worst case scenario. Well, if I don't have any food, then I die. Well, that's the worst case scenario. You die. Well, what happens when you die? Well, well, I believe in Christ. You die on the cross. Huh? I guess I go to heaven. Hmm. So your worst case scenario, three times, is that you end up in heaven with Jesus Christ for eternity, the best place it can be, that's your worst case scenario. I don't think you got anything to worry about. I don't think you got anything to fear. I don't think there's anything you need to be concerned about on this earth because your worst case scenario puts you in heaven. So you see, that's what it means. That's what my understanding of what it means to say death was swallowed up in victory. Because you know there was a time when death had more power than it does now. But when you put death beside Jesus Christ and the Christ child and the hope that he brings and what he came to do, death has no power over us. None. That's what hope does. 
So let's close with talking about practical hope. There are people today who need hope for healing. Hope for the impossible. Hope for acceptance. Hope for life in the midst of death. We are to be those people of hope. If we have Christ, we have hope. But there are still people without Christ who are without hope. This is where the message of the coming Christ prophesied in the Old Testament intersects with the reality that there are people who need to experience the coming of Christ in their lives today. Do you get it? There was a coming of the Christ child. There was a celebration, there was anticipation that went on for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And it happened, but there are still people today who haven't embraced that, who don't know it. So there's still an anticipation, there's still a desire for hope. And we are to be the people of God that help to share that hope because we have the hope. But there are people who want it, who need it, who are yearning for it so badly. Emmanuel is the word for God that we focus on in the scripture today. What does Emmanuel mean? God with us. Do we know that? Do we know without a shadow of a doubt that God is with us? Do we claim it? Do we claim every day God being with us? Or do we simply know it and we embrace it when we want to? Do we live it? Do our actions, do our words, do our thoughts, do what we do, do they reflect the fact that God is with us? And do we share it? Do we share it with people who have been looking and they don't just need a religious experience. They need a God who cares and gives them. So we can enable, we can help a world that's filled with darkness see the light. I think first we need to acknowledge the darkness. The scripture that we read acknowledges that there's evil, there's struggle, there's challenges. And then we recognize it for what it is. That darkness isn't because of a bad person. It isn't just because of situations. Who? What is our battle against? Our battle isn't against other people. Our battle isn't against our situation. Our battle is against the powers of the evil one of those principalities. And when we get so distracted, we're focusing on people that we don't like, that look different from us, that may have different agendas, and we get angry and frustrated and focused on them. We're focused on the wrong thing. That's not the darkness. Those are people that God loves as much as He loves you and me. Those are the ones He came for, and we're putting a barrier between us. We're doing that. Every one of us. I do it too. That should never happen as believers. It does because we're human. But when we come and we proclaim hope like we're proclaiming today, that hope that we proclaim, we need to be able to claim it and share it with everyone. There is not one person that gets left out of that. Not one. And when we do that, then people see that we aren't lifting ourselves up. We live with God. And then there's hope for people who thought there was no hope. Because they're loved and they're cared for. Regardless of who they are. Regardless of where they came from. Regardless of the mistakes they made. That's who Jesus Christ accepts. That's who we need to be able and willing to accept as God needs us as well. We know the light. The light is from Christ. And we aren't the light, but the light shines through us. And through that, the darkness gets dispelled. And people see and experience that hope. So we need to be the light. Allow Christ to give hope through you. We must allow it. That's why the prophecy, the waiting, the anticipation, the hope is so relevant for today. So I close with this. Do you know people who are seeking healing? How does the light of hope shine through you? 
Who do you know that feels like they're facing impossible odds? How does the light of hope shine through you? Are there people in our community who feel left out, unaccepted, or unacceptable? How does the light of hope shine through you? Is death trying to rear its ugly head in someone's life when we know the Christ child turned redeemer has defeated death and death no longer has power over the children of God? How does the light of hope shine through you? I'm going to ask the praise team to come up. And as they do, maybe what you're struggling with, maybe what you're going through, maybe what you're experiencing with others isn't quite that dramatic. Maybe it's just someone who needs to have a sense of purpose. They just feel like they're going through the motions. You know somebody like that? Life is just law right now. Even at the holidays, maybe especially at the holidays. You know what? If we're really experiencing the hope of Christ, that's not going to happen. So you know what we do? I don't mean we, we get a card and we write Jeremiah 29, 11 on it and give it to them at Christmas time. Instead of doing that, you know what we really need to do? I think a lot of times we need to, we need to be willing to walk along beside them into the future. That God has promised them. Because they're not sure they have the strength to do it themselves. They're not sure they have the confidence to do it. So just to tell them, God loves you and you can do it, may not be what God's asking us to do. Maybe we're supposed to be a part of walking on that journey with them. And you know what? We talked about all this hope. And it, it's scriptural. I haven't said anything. I, I mean, I've used more scripture today than I usually do. So you see where it's come from, and you see the promises God made, and you see how they've been fulfilled. And there are hundreds. I think I only used four or five. There are hundreds, not a hundred, hundreds of prophecies in the scripture that are fulfilled, and we can go and look at them. There are promises that you can claim every day. And we can have that type of hope. Do you have that hope? Or are you one of the ones who's struggling to have that hope as well? If you're struggling to have that hope, today can be a day that that changes. Because it's just like that person who asked me that question, why do we spend four weeks anticipating the coming of the Christ child when the Christ child's already here? They're right. We don't have to wait to Christmas Day to experience that hope that, that we're talking about. The Christ child has already come and we're looking forward to it and we're celebrating that. But you need to claim it today. And that hope changes today. And you can know that today. So I invite you. Respond as God will be. Move as God will be. Claim the hope. Live the joy. We need to be examples of our hope and anticipation of what God does is yearning to do in our life as well as the lives of others. I gave you a visual picture of this fourth grader who at some point in the next four weeks is going to be on the edge of her seat looking at this big present and she's just going to be about to come out of her skin to be able to get to it. We should be so much more excited about what God has for us and what God has for others. Are you excited about that today? Or are you just going to say, well, host another Christmas word. We'll do that one today and figure out what the one is next week. Or is hope real and alive and alive? I'll be here to receive any decisions. Respond as the Lord would lead. Let's stand together and sing.
because he knows the relationship Scott has with that person or can have, and me as well. So it's not simply random. God has a plan, and we're to, we're to give ourselves into that, no matter how comfortable or uncomfortable it may be. This is supposed to be a time of hope, but there are a lot of people that don't have it. And I'm looking, I don't know why this came up, but, but Chrissy, do you know people in your work that... They, they may not have ever known what hope was. And, and that's primarily in Nelson County. So we're surrounded by people that need that. That doesn't mean that we fix it all. It simply means we'll be available where that hopelessness crosses our path this week. And be willing to be used by God. To bring maybe the greatest gift this person has ever had and didn't know they even had access to it. Lord, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for the hope that comes with the season, the season of anticipation, the season of prophecy, the season of promises, the season of fulfillment. God, I thank you for the opportunity you're giving us to be a part of that fulfillment. The blessing you've given us in hope and that we get to share with others. Lord, help us to stand up for that and not stand back with it. This prayer we ask in Jesus. We're going to head to small groups as we close it out. There's a couple announcements about small groups. Correct me if I'm wrong, Mandy, we're all heading to the social hall, and we're going to be watching the video together collectively and then breaking off into small groups. So everybody head to the social hall as we close out. Forever rain. Have a good week.